Good morning, everyone. How are you today? And here I'm back. No. <laughs> well, I'm Dr. Aaron Dishno, and this is Walk the Web. So welcome if you found me, and oh, welcome if you find me later. But just wanted to say hello, and I'm back. Yeah, it's been a little bit interesting time through this quarantine, and so you know how that goes. Um, some days been able to stream, other days haven't been able to. We had a tragedy in the family, and so uh, last week was a bit somber. Um, but just want to let you know, we're survivors. We we keep fighting, we keep chugging forward on the program, and gonna bring you it as soon as possible. So some of the things I've been working on lately. This is some kind of dramatic changes to the way you get started when you go to a site. But overall, it's going to be pretty dang cool. So to think about it this way, what we have is this. When you go to a site, I wanted to be able to have a global login so that anybody that downloads and has their own sites and creates them and everything else, as a user, you should be able to go log in once to walk the web, go to any site you want and use the exact same avatar and same login and just visit the sites and do whatever you want to do on their sites. So I've been creating that and throwing it in place and before you know it, we'll have it all up and going. So let me just show you a little bit around of what I've been working on and we'll take it from there. But for beginners, okay, I'm going to log out just so you can kind of see the process here. So I made a nice neat uh, little menu here. While you go to the menu, I'm giving you a little bit of camera control so you can kind of take a visual look at where the, the scene is and where you're going. Hello. Hey, admin, how's it going? And so basically, you can look around a little bit before you enter a scene, but then you're going to be able to choose between your global, your local login to just that website specific, or if you want to continue as anonymous. And if you go global, which in this case, I think I have one set up here. <laughs> and I'm going to say, remember me just for now. And I log in. What it does is, first of all, don't worry about the camera jumping around. That'll be taken care of. Um, I'm kind of doing it in the order of global login, global avatars, then fix all the camera stuff. So don't worry about it at this moment. It will get a lot cleaner and a lot smoother as we go. Okay, so now I have my avatar and this is the one I'm using. Um, we have some different buildings here. I'm just going to kind of cut across the grass here and show you around a little bit. Some of the things we're working on that are kind of cool. One of them is we're building an arcade with, guess what, old games, like an 80s arcade kind of feel to it. Um, I even have an avatar already playing a game. <laughs> But we're going to set this up so that when you walk up here, you're going to be able to click and actually play the game. Then we're going to work on, oops, get around the wall instead of running into it. Over here, we're going to have a game of skee ball that you're going to be able to just click on a ball and it'll pick it up and then you throw it up there and you get your scores. You can play against other people and there'll be some high score lists and things. So we're getting those up and going. We threw some nice little park benches here and trees. So we're getting the feel of a nice little place. Uh, there's always more to add, but right now that's where we're at. Over here, we've got the same old door swing open and you can walk in. We're working on adding some automated avatars that like here, hey, it's loading. It takes a second to load. I'm going to do some more preloading, so don't, you know, don't dismay. We will make it preload and so by the time you get there, it'll already load. We have some workers. Um, we've been talking about where if you click on a worker, you're going to be able to ask the questions and find out what you want to order. Uh, we have this already hooked up to uh, WooCommerce website on WordPress. And if you click on the various buttons, you can actually load the web pages. Kind of cool. So we can read more about the product. You can also put things in your shopping cart. You can do it right through the web page because this is your actual web page from uh, from over there or you can uh, from uh, WooCommerce otherwise you can click on add to cart and it will automatically just drop it right in the cart and there you go your product is in the cart just by clicking it so we still have that interface going from there as you can see with Webby there we we have animations you can add in all kinds of cool stuff and here I'm running with about 20 windows open. There you go. How's that? <laughs> I know. It's me that does that. 
Okay, so another thing we can do is we can run down the block. We got a little guy playing guitar. Um, save our that. We got some sound that happens as you get closer. And as you turn, it's actually stereo, so it'll be playing more in one ear than the other. Um, we got some loading things that I'm still going to work on and see if we can preload some of these uh, things before you get to them so that when it tells it to load it, they pop up there very quickly. We have another little person listening on the deck there. Uh, we have another person sitting over here clapping and enjoying the show. We have the whole bar scene. Hey, Java Juice. No. <laughs> okay, so that's some of the stuff we have. We also have full-on videos that you can play right from here and notice it plays no matter if I move around and walk and do different things it still plays the video so we're good with all that you can pause the video you can continue it back up just by pushing play again you can also go full screen if you want to which opens it in a different tab and then you can watch the video in full screen so we have a couple different options going in there okay and that's the video function so that's just a handful of things we have on the front end that we've been working on and we'll continue to add things on that side of it but uh, okay then on the back side let's jump into admin side of things if you haven't been in here in a little while we have some cool stuff for example first of all media library you can upload you have got your files it has some stock files in there when you start we have your 3D objects, which are things that we pulled in that we created using Blender. They include, uh, they can include um, animations. Like in this example, the guy sitting at that bar. He has all these files, which includes the graphics and the Babylon file. I, keep, I tend to store my Blender files up here too and, so that I don't lose track of which one I'm using in a scene. But there it is, everything's there, and we have the animations, which are defined here. And we tell it, oh, call it this name in JavaScript, so you can call it from other things, by the way. And here's the frames, number of frames that it has, and I tell it to loop the animation. We can also set the speed and tie different sound effects to it. So if we want to hear it clap or something like that, we can easily tie different sound effects to that particular animation and adjust the speed so that it claps right with the you know sound of clapping that's not a problem so yo yo hey waffles how's it going yeah i'm just doing a little walkthrough showing off some of the things we've done since the last time i've streamed and some of the latest functionalities we also have walk the web downloads where you can download a scene a 3d building or different things to put into your scenes, such as tables, chairs, and uh, you can search for different things. Uh, I think if I said bridge, I think I got a couple bridges in here. Later on, you're going to be able to upload these things and share them with each other and stuff. So this will get populated more once I allow that, open those floodgates open. But so far, that's where we're going with that. So you do have some cool stuff where you can download and throw into scenes. Just have to type a keyword and see what you find. Um, like if I said chair. There's a bunch more than what the first page showed. And we got rocking chairs and benches and different types of seating. Some office chairs and stuff. Uh, we'll have more. This is just something that we're getting started with. In buildings, we also have things like, um, like a lighthouse. Once again, we'll fix these things up and we'll throw a bunch of stuff in here. Uh, but it's going to be at the point where when you're building something, all you have to do is when you load it, let's say I have, for example, that beach bar. That's not shared yet. All I'll have to do is load it up, go to options and settings, and right now it's disabled, but in the templates, um, the test site, it's actually running. And you can actually click on a link, set a snapshot, which is just like this. Oops, helps if I, there it is. Everybody's loading, everything's there. I can come in here, for example, and say, oh, this is what this place looks like. Move it up so it's a little bit all on the screen. And then if I building snapshot, set snapshot, it'll take a picture and set it up. That'll be what gets shared out. Oh, we got an error on the page. Okay, that'll be something I'll put on my list to check out. 
I probably renamed something. No, no worries. I'll put it on a uh, Trillo board. We'll get it handled. <laughs> Snapchat didn't work. Um, that was something that worked last week, so I probably changed something that broke it. So let's put that in Trillo. Um, okay, there we go. Just want to track that, so I'll remember to go back and fix it up. It's all good. So what have you guys been up to? Hey, looking good to keep it up. Thank you. You have some ideas for screens. Very cool, Waffles. Yeah, share, share, share. <laughs> Trying out a new game. Oh, cool. That's cool. Yeah. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. So I'll check on that. It should have uploaded a picture, and then it snapshots it. The good part is when you share the link to this particular site that has like this building, it will actually show that picture as the image for that site. So it's kind of cool when you do the snapshots. Um, we also have that for communities. So if I say, oh, for example, Demo Beach. Let me see if this thing loads. I haven't checked it in a while, so <laughs> not everything works as expected. But some of it does, some of it doesn't. Okay, it's loading up. And I don't have an avatar. <laughs> Let's see, is it still loading? There it is. There's my avatar. It's a good sign. Okay, so this particular scene, one of the things I threw in here is we actually have Manhattan Pier from California. And notice as I'm walking, it's actually loading different things. Um, I'm going to do some more preloading so it doesn't happen after the fact. But like right now, there's going to be a little lighthouse, light guard, lifeguard house there. Hello, Siddharth. How you doing? Yeah, so here we go. Okay, it caught up a little bit. I'm going to do some more preloading, so that stuff is going to happen as we go. The other part is as I'm running down this thing, notice the, the street lamps here. Um, doing good. Yeah, I'm doing good. Doing good. Getting out here. Um, some of the loading, I don't have it preloading, so it's happening a little slower than I plan on it being when I'm done. But as you can see, it still loads as you go. Yeah, thank you, bookies. How you doing? I know I haven't been on the stream lately, so the fact that I haven't seen some of you lately is my fault. <laughs> but I'm back. We're here. And that's all that matters, right? But yeah, this, uh, this particular ground, you can see how detailed the ground is and everything else in here. This is getting there. This is where I want to get to. I want to be able to do this kind of stuff. <coughs> this particular building is actually... Um, or actually, this thing was purchased from uh, 3D models online. So I was able to get this thing. Look at the ground quality. I mean, we're talking good, good graphics, good textures, good everything. But everything's this high quality. Even the building walls, um, we have the shadows doing pretty well on it. We have the details of the quality of everything. So yeah, so we're definitely getting there. I'll make it where we can throw open some window or the doors on this so you can walk into that later on. We'll keep adding to it. But there's all kinds of cool stuff that we've been throwing into the scene and trying and testing stuff. As you can tell, it's, tell it's a pretty good-sized pier. And as we're walking, of course, I'll slow down a little bit, but let it catch up. Preloading is what it's all about. I'll get the preloading going. But there it is. And so it shows up the lifeguard tower as we go. Um, there's also, we have a lifeguard booth down there and an umbrella oops got my rotation turned up a little fast i just spun myself right out of the direction i wanted to go i <laughs> wanted to show that it can spin fast and turn fast and react and instead all i'm doing is making it faster than i can turn okay so when i walk over here now we see some people on the beach those are just some um autobots so it's people visiting and waving their arms around and talking and stuff that's the kind of stuff we're going to be able to do. Uh, it already does it, obviously. I loaded them through the media library into the scene. Okay, and um, the whole idea is that we're going to just smooth this right on out so that you can keep on building stuff and things will load as you're walking up. Like here, we got a building in the distance. And notice that when we're this far away from the building, I'm going to kind of sneak up on it on an angle because I want to show you that we don't have any... Uh, 
any arcade games or anything like that loaded at this level. All we did was load the outside of the building, and then as you get closer, it loads up more of what's on the inside of the building, and there goes some of the games. And in the distance, we start to see some other things that are loading. Um, so the idea is to balance the scene so that you load some things so you know, hey, walk over there, there's something worth checking out. And then when you get closer, it loads more details of what's inside there. Then we completely unload and load it as you go. Uh, if you want to see how that stuff works, um, this is probably not the best thing, it's very crowded. But let me select a different community, the one that we started with. Yeah, thank you, Bookus. Yeah, we are making great progress. I'll keep on working on the loaders, but right now, excuse me, my task is going from global logins so that any scene you go to, you can use your avatar and you can log in with one and you don't have to worry about every single site you go to having to create another login or remember passwords and all that stuff. So I'm setting up the global logins. They're already in place, but what I haven't done is tie the avatars to them yet. In a second, I'll give you an overview of where we're going with the avatars. It's pretty cool. I built a separate avatar constructor so you can actually customize and build your own avatar when you're there. So you don't have to do it in this other scene. You can actually do it at that place. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm still healthy. Thank you, Bookus. Appreciate it. Um, working on it. <laughs> is the music too loud in your guys' ear? How is it doing? You guys good? Or I know I got some background music. I don't even know if you can hear it. I got it in my ear. <laughs> but okay, so when I take a scene like this, for example, if I back up a little ways, uh, like that front awning just disappeared, if I turn on action zones, now you can see the boxes around different objects. Yeah, as you can see, there's different ones for different things. As I'm walking, we're walking in and out of these different boxes. And like there's a box right there on the ground. You can kind of see the outline of it on the street. When I walk into this region, guess what? It turns on the awning and you can see it in front of the building. So you can hear it. It's not too loud. Good, good, good. Appreciate it. Okay, sounds good, sounds good. Okay, and then as I walk out of the box, it disappears. Well, there are different boxes defined at different distances away from things. I have one that I call the extreme zone, which is like the outside of the building, something you see at a distance that attracts you to want to go check it out and learn more. Then I have a near, which when you get to it, it automatically loads the things that would be like eh, window displays and outside of the building details. Then I have one when you go inside of a building that is actual creating what's inside by default. But you can, in the editor, you can actually change these things and add as many as you want to different areas. So if you say, hey, if I walk in front of this window, I want a box that as I get there, it shows me certain things in the window and turns on animations or whatever. You can trigger all kinds of JavaScript events just as you get there. So it becomes actually pretty cool to be able to stack that kind of stuff together and make it work <laughs> right when you're there. So it's actually a neat little system of basically like an orchestra. You put these different zones in different places. You try to make it where not too many of them activate at the exact same time. So you kind of stagger them a little bit. It'll uh, queue up what needs to be loaded into the scene adds it automatically, and then when you walk out, it queues it up and actually gets rid of them in that order uh, that they're that you leave. So like right here, the awning disappears as <laughs> soon as I walk out of that particular box, which right there, you can see the edge of it. So when I'm back in it, awning shows back up, and we're walking up here to do more. So that's the kind of concept between everything in one of these scenes. Now, something else that helps us is that we did this on three different levels. I call it the communities, which is actually the scene. So that's the setting, that's the roads, that's the grass, that's the little hills in the background and stuff. Now, um, try not to criticize my artwork too bad. I'm learning and I'm learning Blender and all these other fun stuff and I'm getting better and we're making more details as I go. But there are people that are a lot better artists. This stuff, just so you know, can currently do 4K, and even load 8K graphics. I'm not stopping you from doing it. But they take longer to download, and you got to have a little bit more resources on your machine to be able to run them because it is running all this stuff client-side. So keep that in mind. But it will do 4K graphics. It will do the whole thing and 8K graphics. We have no limitations on there. Just like any game, the more graphics you do, the more <laughs> resources you have to have on your machine to be able to pull it off. 
I do give you this choice also. When you upload graphics in the system and use them, not through Blender, but if you like created using my tools to build things, one of the things I give you is an option to change your graphics quality. And you can go, obviously you can go real high, it's gonna reboot or reset, it reloads to make sure I'm on the highest quality. Um, by default, all the Blender objects will be at that quality, so you don't have to worry about it. But the idea is this, you can set it so that everything is forced to load at the highest quality. The middle ground, it only does things that you checkbox to say force it to the highest quality. Otherwise, it'll do a nice friendly quality. And then there's low graphics, which force it to go to the lowest graphics. So like if the scene works real slow for you, you can always lower the graphics quality and make it run just fine for you. So we have a few different options. Um, you know, you can always get whatever size quality of graphics you expect. Uh, make sure that everybody can use it. Okay, other things. So, communities are our scenes. Then we have buildings. Now, the reason I separated them into buildings is because I want you to be able to build a building and then drop it into many scenes. So, by doing it this way, you create one building, you maintain it in one place. It can be anywhere on the internet with this open source code. And then you can have it dropped into different scenes anywhere else on the internet. They don't have to be on the same server. That's what's really cool about it. So let's say I had a, a game for a um, go-kart track. I can have it. People can go play. Let's say if you download my game for free, we build this into a plugin. You download it for free. You get, hey, here's a track. You can run the track and people in your scene can play the go-kart. But... I'm a developer, I wanna make some money. So what I do is I say, hey, I have seven more tracks that you can unlock if you pay this fee. Or you can buy tracks. Let's say you just keep on building different tracks that they can play. Then basically people can go on the server level, the person who owns the site, not the end users, but the person who owns the site can say, okay, I'm gonna give you a choice of these three tracks and they're gonna purchase the extra tracks from you. You just made some money as a programmer and they got more functionality into their scene. So now if I'm a business owner, for example, I might have a 3D store where you can go shopping in my store and buy t-shirts. Well, next door, I have a go-kart track and you can go, people will come because they wanna play the go-kart track, but you can also buy a t-shirt when you're there and it's a real store. So just like I was showing you, my little Webby store example, this, you know, this is not the, I don't have a lot of products, so hey, I did what I could. I threw in a pair of 3D glasses and sell them for five bucks. Uh, for three sets of them. <laughs> so it's just something to have. Uh, but here in my store, when I walk over here, okay, notice first of all, even the awning, I threw animation on the outside of the store. So the awning looks like it's blowing in the breeze. When you walk inside, notice I have the, there's a ceiling fan inside and it's going. As I walk closer, notice how more things inside the store are loading. I didn't want to load them until you're right there because a computer can only run so much. And you've seen how games do it. Let's load everything for a level. When you beat that level, we'll unload it all. Now we'll load level two. Well, I kind of put it like on a conveyor belt. When you load something because you walk close enough, it loads it and you can use it. But then you can decide, hey, I'm going to go ahead and walk away from it. I completely unload it as clean as possible so that you still have that amount that you can run in your machine as you walk up on something else. So instead of a load, load this game, now play this game, all you're doing is walking towards it and it's loading so that you can play it when you get there. So we can have, you know, a paintball arena. We can have a go-kart track. We can have a golf course. We can have anything that loads the game logic as you walk up to it because it's a separate building. It doesn't have to be a physical building. It could be a golf course. But at the same time, it loads as you walk up and then it unloads when you walk away. <laughs> now I've been doing some work so that you can load specific animations. For example, you walk up on a golf course, you need to be able to putt the ball. Well, you don't need that graphic loaded all the time when you walk into a store. So I unload those animations afterwards. So they're only being used when you need them. So we have different functionality of our store in here. It's selling the products that are in my store, which happens to be just these 3D glasses at this time. I can click on read more. It will open it up. Let me see here. Let's go read more. Did it load it? Did it load it? Okay, some of the things are buggy, but we're working on it. 
this is the kind of stuff we're testing through and we're, we're streamlining it and fixing it. If I re reload this from scratch, it's gonna work. So something caused it not to load when I walk back up on it, but we're close. Believe me, it works nine out of 10 times. <laughs> we're gonna make that a lot better by the time I'm done. Okay, so you get the general idea of how stores work. So somebody can come in here, shop, and they actually purchase something, and next thing you know, it shows up on their doorstep because we would actually ship it to them. That's the thing. We're blending games and real businesses. So before, if you wrote a game, it's going to take you two, three years to write the game. Well, in this case, you can write one component of a game. You don't even have to make the whole game. You could add a feature that people want with their avatars. You could add something that they want to drop into their scenes. It could be a game or it could be a functionality. It doesn't have to be a complete game. Uh, let's say you had a store where the avatars could get hats. Just a hat store. Simple. Well, we'll create something and we'll get out there and we'll start doing things with a web coin kind of thing. And next thing you know, you're buying and trading different virtual goods online. We, you know, we're opening the doors. We're not limiting what people can do. We're basically just opening the doors, letting people have an environment where, let's say, here I have an environment. It's multi-user already, and everybody can come in here and play and have fun and walk around these scenes. All we have to do is tell them, hey, here's another scene. They come in there and check out what that scene has to offer because we're setting the standard across the board of how we design them and what it expects when you tell it to download another site and put it into my scene. So by distributing and telling everybody how that works, you can create anything you want and make it work in this 3D internet concept. Okay, so we have communities, which are your scenes. I mentioned the buildings that are separate things that are dropped into communities. And then I created one more level, which is your things. Things are really cool because Things are like, your avatars are things, which especially the Autobot ones. You can have vehicles, you can have lamp posts, like in this case, we have street lamps. We have trees, we have tables and chairs and counters and cash registers and all these various items are things that you would put into a scene or into a building. So they're dynamic that way. Um, now picture this, you got your scene, you drop a building here, but then another one, you drop it here and all these other things. I set it up where it's like a pin drop type system. It adds a little dot and says, this is where the building is going to go. It's going to rotate this way and it's automatically going to scale this way. To show you how that works, I'm going to pick a building that I've already done. So I'm going to walk over here where you can see I'm even letting it load the building. It doesn't matter how much of it's loaded. It, it still works, it loads and unloads things as you're as you do them. Okay, if I right click on any scene while I'm editing the scene, I can now edit where the building is. I can easily shift it, move it around. I can scale it. So if I wanted this building to be huge, I can do that. Now it's twice the size. Um, I can scale it a little bit. So it only changes a little bit at a time. So we have some fine tuning of how big you want the particular items which allows us to take build it once and then fit it into any scene. Let's say I need a little alley between the buildings. I can squeeze it a little smaller. Now there's an alley between the buildings. So there gives you a lot of control of how big you drop it into the scene. The other thing we can do is we can rotate them. So yes, we can have some fun. Uh, if you want it level, great, that's all fine. You can also rotate them. But that also means I can rotate it to fit into my scene You know, this way too so that it fits right where I want it in the scene. All I'd have to do normally is click save. In this particular case, I'm gonna click cancel, or you can click delete building and it'll take it out and you can actually put in a different building. But that's how the editor works. It allows us to add and remove items, including even these street lamps. Look, I picked that up, here's the street lamp, here's the definition of it. Hey, if I want it twice as tall, it's twice as tall. It's real easy to move things and create them and scale them to make them look right for your particular scene. Now, on top of doing things like that, I'm gonna say cancel because that's you know the way I want it to be. On top of that, when you have like a thing or a building or something, like right now we're in a community. If I come over here, I'm just gonna pick a random spot. And I'm gonna say, okay, when I'm in this area over here, 
I want to put a building right here. So all I have to do is edit my community, add or edit building to our community. Now there's a couple things. We can add a building, we can add a thing right here directly into here, or I can do things like web objects and building blocks. So if I just need a sphere there and I want to put a texture on it, I can throw in a building block level and actually create things. I also have the ability to cut things out of it. So I can make a sphere and then cut a cylinder out of it. Those kind of things are all in the building blocks. I'm not going to dig into that part today, but I'm, I just want you to know they're there. We'll get to a couple of these things. But first of all, I want to put a building in this scene. All I have to do is select from any building I have. Currently, it's on your own server, but it will work. I've already tested it to work from server to server. I'm writing that into the connector piece that I'm creating right now so that we have some type of security between the sites. So you don't have to worry about somebody maliciously adding some JavaScript that all your users are now running. We're going to have some security levels. Okay, so I'm going to pick... Um, let me pick... Uh, Let's go Mountain Lodge just to have something, and I'm going to say Add 3D Building. Now what this does is, first of all, it throws in a Mountain Lodge. Um, I'm going to rotate it here and get it where it's facing us. And it's this easy to add new buildings to your scene. Ah, that's the back side, so I'm going to turn it the other direction. Uh, you can also type numbers in these boxes, and when you move away from them, that's when it... Uh, when it activates so it's on the blur at you're all programmers you know that deal the other part is you can i just did that backwards anyway so well you can also raise it up right now it's under the ground i'm going to make sure it's at the right level uh bring it to right about there you can also fine tune with the smaller adjustments and i'm backwards right now so let's make that 90 degrees i was turning it the wrong direction the whole time there we go now i have the entrance Notice it's too close to my building and my other tree, so I'm going to slide it over that other direction and get it get it off there. So I'm going to kind of watch this side and move it. Now well, that's away from the street. Let's go this one. Whoops, wrong way. <laughs> Eventually I'll hit it right. You'd like to live there? <laughs> Very cool, Bookus. Yeah, see, this is the kind of cool stuff. Now imagine you're going to create your own buildings. You're going to create your own places you live. You're going to build those kind of things. And... Now all of a sudden we're going to get, uh, everybody's going to have their own building and their own place. And it's going to be like a social network here. You come in here and next thing you know, you've got everybody's house. Hey, I want to go visit, uh, go visit Bookus. I want to go visit Admin. I want to visit, uh, you know, Siddhard. I want to visit, uh, yeah, calling you all out now. <laughs> and Waffles, yes. And Waffles will have his own house or maybe even a store or whatever. But see, just by putting it here, I can walk up here and door opens. Those things are all attached to the building when you add them. So if I want to keep this here, all I have to do is say save, it's here. If I decide I want to edit it, shrink it, scale it, larger, bigger, whatever you want to do, all you have to do is right click it and now you're editing it again. So that's all part of our editor features. The next thing is, oh, let's say I decide, hey, I need a tree out front or something. You can do things like add a 3D thing. Here's a list of different things that you've already downloaded and put on your machine. Or you can go to back to the other stuff, search for things in your media library, and you can actually search for things on the server and download different stuff. Um, I have, ah, let's see, birch tree. I don't even know what it, that one is. And when I get the tree in here, it takes a second to load. Do, 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 do. Oh, it's down 12. It's probably underground. Let's bring it up. Come on, did I not? Do I have a complete birch tree or is this a broken object? <laughs> I'm going to, the reason I haven't put that out there where we're sharing objects yet, there we go, there's a tree. So instead of um, sharing some of these objects yet, I didn't, uh, I want to go through them all before I let you share again because some of them were built a long time ago and I've changed so much of the interface that I want to make sure and double check what's in there. So we're going to be doing some things like, um, making sure all the different scenes are there that are complete. We'll ramp them up in scale so that the, the graphic quality is there. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of that stuff in the near future here. We're going to do some new 3D stores so that you can really have some fun with them. Um, I can move this whole stuff here and put the tree right where I want it. 
It's also pretty cool because I can rotate it and make sure that it's the direction I want it. Or let's say this one blew down in the wind a little bit. I can lean it out or away or whatever I want to do. You can also scale it. So if you want it to be a little bit bigger, you can, you can do things like that. It also helps because you can take one tree, scale them different scales, and rotate them different ways, and they actually look like they're different trees in a scene. So that kind of helps on some of that. Let's say we want to go taller, and there we go. Now we have that, and I say save, and it's there. Okay, Bookus, um, in case you want to place any object on a place, uh, where should it be? Um, it shouldn't be. Like you placed it uh, over a tree. Will that destroy that tree? or you won't be able to place that new object on top of a tree. Well, right now you can place them. When you're moving around objects, they go right through other things. The idea is I can place the house, then I can just right click the tree and move the tree to make sure that it's not in the house. So it's your playground. This is for the person setting up the website. So it's not our end users, because you know how to be. Our end users would jump in here and just start dropping houses in the top floor of a building. I mean, you know, it, it could be all kinds of weird, crazy stuff, right? But at the same time, what they're doing is this one allows us to, um, to set it up, but you're creating your own website. So if you want a tree inside the house, you put a tree inside the house. It's your building. Um, so I'm not blocking you from doing anything. I'm just enabling you to be able to do it the way you want to be. Now, here's another cool trick. Let's say I built this building and I want to show it off on a showroom floor that different buildings you can choose. This is kind of cool. Right now it's, you know, one to one to one scale. I can go 0.1 scale and I want to show you that everything still works, even on 0.1 to 1 to 1 scale. Notice how I'm not in the load zone, so I got to walk over to it before it shows up. But there's my 1 to 1 to 1 scale. It's a dollhouse now. <laughs> so basically, you can do anything you want, anything you've built, scale it any way in any scene. Just wanted to show you how versatile it is. Hey, how's it going? Welcome aboard. Soulsy 5, cool. Godzilla mode, yeah. Walk through and destroy buildings, right? Okay, so let's see. I'm not going to save it that size. I want it to be the original size. If your avatar ends up inside something, it'll automatically rise up to go to the top of it. That's part of the collision system. And I just walk myself right into a door. <laughs> I got to do something about that. When the door opens and I'm like right in it, <laughs> notice I run into the door. That's me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so basically I'll have to make sure I <laughs> stand, let the door open, then walk through it. You know, some little learning curves. <laughs> So yeah, so that stuff is very versatile for that kind of stuff. Now in web objects, this is cool. Babylon files are our uploaded files from Blender. It's not just Babylon files. You can actually load OBJ files. You can load GTL, uh, GTLB, no, GTLF, GTLF files, GLB files, and Babylon files at this time. Uh, there's other loaders, so we'll keep on adding them to the features. Oh, something I'm forgetting. Here we talk about 3D internet all this time. Um, so yeah, so here we're talking about 3D internet, right? And one of the things I didn't even show you is that at any time, you can go 3D with this. Look, your views, 3D glasses. <laughs> there, we got red, we got the red blue script split, red cyan split. And throw on your 3D glasses, your cheap $5 ones that you can buy in my store. Eh, little shameless plug. No, I know, $5. I'm not planning to get rich on that. No, <laughs> but see, now you've got 3D there. You can also go quickly to VR headset and now you're looking at it in VR mode and it will display in all, all those. We have a default one with a gamepad that you can turn on. Does the same camera work, but at the same time it is with the gamepad. So we do have some options like that. Um, also, you can go to, for example, first person and it actually picks up the movement from the avatar's head. I'm going to be doing some more work on the cameras, so don't beat me up too hard on that yet. We can also go to a scene camera, so it's a little bit farther back than the normal follow camera. I'll, I'll explain where I'm going with that stuff later on, but uh, you also have a selfie camera, so you can see what your own avatar looks like and do different things. 
Um, we'll set it up where you can take selfie pictures later too. We'll have some fun with that. So the other part is there is a second camera, so we can have one turned on in the top right corner, and you can be watching the scene while you're watching this. Uh, we have plans to create some site maps up in the top right so that you can actually see where you're walking in relation to other buildings and stuff. We're not there yet, but we will be, so I'll, we'll make sure we get there. Uh, another thing you can do when you get into these scenes is you can actually change your movement speed. So if you decide, hey, it's too fast or too slow for me, I crank mine up. I walk as fast as I possibly can, and my turn speed is pretty quick. It's not the fastest setting. Another little helpful hint is your cursor needs to be on the page for you to be able to run around. Um, you know, when you move it off the page, eh, the reason for doing that was when I was walking and I'd move my cursor off the page and stop walking, well, it would continue walking until you stop the animation. So I wanted to make sure that it automatically stops it when you move your cursor off the page. So little experience points there. Another thing you can do, you can use your keyboard commands. So all you gamers out there, which probably is every single one of you right now, when you move your, you know, the ASD, W buttons and stuff, you got forward, you got your rotation, I mean, you got your strifing. Um, I also added Q and E for rotating on those, and I did R and F for looking up and down. Another thing you can do is use your mouse. You can look up or down, left and right, just by holding down the left mouse button. And the scroll wheel will let you walk forward. So look, one-handed, I'm on the mouse, and I'm walking forward. You can use either one of those at any time. Touch screen works. Left side tends to move you around forward, backwards, and the right hand tends to point you in the different directions. So we have touch controls hooked up. Um, that's just some of the features we have in here. As you can tell, we've been building and adding a lot of pieces in here. And um, basically, it's a playground for developers to create 3D websites, drop them in very quickly, very easily. Like, let's say you have somebody you want to build a 3D website for and sell it to them, okay? You can download Walk the Web from GitHub. You can easily take buildings or things you've already created and drop them into that site to help build up their scene. Then you build them a custom building in Blender or even in this product, you can build it directly in here and you give them their own store, just like that. You get paid, you put these things together and you even drop games that other people have built. You don't even have to write everything yourself. You put together a scene and instead of taking two, three years to develop a game, you can throw together a scene in a, a week of you building a custom building along with a bunch of other things you just drop into the scene. Or if you don't need to do a custom building, use some template buildings, drop it in there, and you can have a site up and going for them in the same day. Okay, so that's where I'm heading with this. But yet you can, just, as a programmer though, you can make money for creating sites for people that are game scenes. You can help businesses get 3D stores out there. You can create plugins just like you do for WordPress. They're freemium where you give them a little something for free to have some fun, but then you ramp it up with unlocking different things or even subscription things so you can make money in the long run. And think of it this way. Let's say you're great at making cars. Well, then why should you have to build a whole game to have a car in it? If you're great at making cars, make a car. You could have one where, hey, I can drive the Jeep for free. Now, if I want uh, avatars to climb in the passenger seat or get in the back, or if I want to unlock the Ferrari or something, now you have to pay to unlock it on that server. Then the person who owns the website would say, oh, on my site, I want people to be able to drive around cars. They download, put your plugin into their site, boom, they're up and running, and you made money because you gave them extra cars and extra features that they wanted to unlock. That's the idea. That's the concept behind it. So you'll be able to make money for creating 3D websites for people, helping them create custom items like uh, in Blender, creating their stores and creating different scenes or different things that they want to show off as part of their products or different things that they do. And you can make money in plugins for creating game components. You can create complete games as a plugin and drop it in so people can use them in their scenes. You can create um, avatar sets. You can create anything your mind is, anything game related. You can create them, create it as a plugin. We'll put up, we're gonna create up a marketplace so that when people come in here, they can actually search and download and find things. Um, we have a media library already. We have 
your files that you've uploaded in some stock files. So um, also just a little convenience, anything used in the current scene or thing that you're working on, you can go community files or building files or you know thing files, and it'll show you any of the textures already used in that scene. So you can reuse the same textures just by finding them easy on different things like the roads, for example. Then we have the 3D objects, which are your things you've uploaded from Blender. Okay, and you got a bunch of settings with that, including animations. You can, uh, not only does it have animations, but I wanted to show you. I showed you this at the beginning, but I wanted to show you. You upload your files. You upload, or you can set up your animations, and you can tell it, like, here's the name I want to call the JavaScript that runs. I have different events. So you can have an onload, an on click, a toggle, which means you click on, and then you click to shut it back off afterwards. Um, I tested it on a desk with a drawer. It opens the drawer and then it closes the drawer afterwards. So it's pretty cool stuff. You have mouse overs and mouse outs. And then I'm working on setting it up with avatar movements also. So if you uploaded your own avatar, you can load all kinds of functionality to that avatar based on how you would normally control an avatar. So I'm the concept of what I'm doing, just so you know, is about opening the doors for programmers and developers to have fun and create anything they want. And this basically brings it all together to work in scenes. That's the concept. That's where we're going with this. Okay, so as you ask for things, I'm going to find a way to do it. And that's that's my goal, is to make sure you have no roadblocks to adding what you want to do and add to these scenes. Okay, so you're also going to be, oh, there was one more section in there that you should see. And that is web downloads. Right now, you can download some scenes. Eh, some work better than others. I haven't te retested them all. Um, but then we have some buildings, and let's say, for example, if I say store, I have some different stores that were created early on. So we'll be going back through all those and making sure they're you know clean and ready to go so you can use them as a store. Um, but that's the kind of stuff that we have in there so far. I'm going to create some really high quality Blender ones or download and add them to the system you know, with commercial licenses and stuff. So we'll see. I'll work on that for you guys. Um, but that's the idea. And the thing is, you can build things, you can share them. I'm going to set up a marketplace in here so that you can actually offer for sale. Let's say you build a really cool store. You can actually sell your store on here. You're going to be able to upload it to the system and make it available so people can buy it and use it in here. And so that's the kind of stuff we're doing. Uh, I want to make it a playground in a way that developers can make money because I watch out for all of you, by the way. Okay, now that we've done that part... It's been a little while, and I want to do a little bit of a code walkthrough for you so that you get a, the latest and greatest updates of some of the things we've changed in the code style. And, um, well, bear with me for two seconds, and then we'll get there. What I want to show you is this. Uh, right now, I'm actually creating an avatar designer. By default, you can create, you can select different avatars. We're going to have different classes of avatars. So by the time we're done... You're going to be able to go, um, I want a fantasy character, and then pick through them. You're going to be able to say that you want a, um, I'm running out of coffee. No. You're going to be able to say, I need somebody that works in space. I need somebody that works in wherever, whatever it is, medieval times, whatever it is. You're going to be able to pick your categories, and then you're going to have a handful of avatars that you can use. You pick which avatar you want. So you pick which one you want to go with. And it's going to update into my scene here. It's loading it. Is it loading it? Come on. This is the part I'm building right now. So if this doesn't work, eh, bear with me. I'm working on a different section right now. So I probably broke that part or maybe just need to reload it. I think I logged off and logged on a couple times. So I want to make sure it allows me to do it. Okay. So when I click select avatar, I can click on somebody. And it didn't load. Dang, come on. I know, I forced it to show me this one because I'm working on the next section. So I didn't want to keep reloading avatars every time I open up the program. So that's why it's probably hard-coded to only be him right now. So, um, well, actually, since I'm showing you this, let me unbreak my code real quick. <laughs> and, oh, I know what I did. I hard-coded the... Did I? Where'd I put it? Uh, 
Um, I thought I told it my avatar ID to load. Okay, well, never mind. I was going to show you real quick. Okay, but here's the deal. Right now, this is a little peek at what I'm doing. You can set your avatar name, and it automatically sets it up here. We can do colors, and you can pick either over here which item you want to do. For example, if you click the shoes, notice they highlight real quick and shows you're on the shoes, and you can set them to whatever color you like. You can also type a color over here. If you go with white, then, you know, just FFFF, uh, six Fs, then basically, or even three, it does three or six digit codes. Um, but if you do those kind of things, then it goes back to the original graphics in color. Um, but otherwise, I can do, I can type something in here, whatever color I want it to be. And when it goes to something else, it'll change the color to whatever you picked. Um, you can also click on the scene and pick something, like you want to change his color of his pants. I can go to some blue jeans. I can go to his shirt and say, okay, I want to go to green or whatever. And you can set them up and decorate them and color them any way you want. And you, you're going to be able to always be able to do this every single day. So if you want to change what they're wearing, whatever, you're going to be able to come in here and do it. Um, I can, you know, so we have quite a bit of functionality to whatever you want to do. <laughs> Doesn't matter what you pick. Uh, so you have different options. Okay. Uh, we also have, for example, the skin. You can even change the skin color. So whatever you feel like being that day, whatever mood you're in, whatever you want to do. Hey, look, we got a Donald Trump uh, suntan right here. We have that mode. No, <laughs> just kidding. Just a joke, just a joke. I don't need any phone calls. No. <laughs> but yeah, so we do this stuff, and you have all these different options to color it. And then what I'm doing right now is I'm working on a way that you can set up all your different animations. One of the things you can do in the actual app right now is I can show you the animations. When you click here, I'm moving them from here, by the way. So when you click Added Avatar, you're going to get that other screen. But for now, what you get is you can come in here and you can say Avatar Animations, and you get a choice to change and work with anything you want. So like right now, when I walk around, I get this very rigid, hey, default walk, whatever. Okay, now I want to come in here and say, oh, I'm in a bad mood. I'm going to my sad walk. And it's going to reload. And then when you do it, he's moping. See, he walks like this now. You can change any one of the animations for your characters. Um, just for now, I'm going to close this scene. So I'm not walking around the scene. I don't want it to reload it every time. <laughs> it's not reloading the whole scene, by the way. It was just reloading my avatar. But it remembers your settings. So as soon as you click on something different, it automatically set it up. And it'll remember what you're doing. If you want, you can also turn it to a selfie camera. And then you're editing your avatar like in the other scene where we could spin it around and stuff. Um, oh yeah, speaking of which, when you are working on your avatar, you can move it around and look from all directions. Yay! The crowd goes wild. No. <laughs> so you can look around at your avatar and make sure that it looks good from everywhere. And what we're going to have in there is, just like in here, you're going to be able to choose all your different... Uh, where's my... I move to the other menu. Let me get back to edit my avatar. Oh, it's jumping back to that scene. Okay, fine. I'll make it work. Well, obviously, in the other scene, you're going to be able to run the animations without having that. So these little flow bugs that I'm working on, but I'm changing up some of the camera stuff. So we'll, we'll have all that squared away soon. You can pick any one of these animations, and then you can test them out and see which ones you like. Every one of them have a little bit of a drop-down menu, and you can pick what you want to do. So whatever style of something you want to do, that's kind of a funny running scared. Okay, and you can also do optional gestures. You can load multiple ones. So if you have a couple of them already, you can load additional ones. Um, let's say taunting gesture, for example. Okay, to fire off these, there's a little button down here and you just hold down the button. There's salsa dancing. And if you decide you want to do the taunting gesture, here it is. Hey, let's fight. Let's fight. Yeah, come on. <laughs> so, and we got a wave. So that's where you see these extra optional gestures. So you can customize your avatar. There's over, gosh, over 150 different animations you can use. And we'll throw more in there. 
But that stuff will be in this other app for creating your avatar before you even get to a scene, which means we're also going to be able to save them globally. So if you log in globally, you can say, oh, I want to use my character that I built this one, or I want to use this other character I built in this scene. You're going to be able to choose. Now, when you build a scene, I'm going to have it where you can set the category too. So if you say this scene is for sci-fi and fantasy characters only, then you can set that limitation and everybody has to have that type of character to join the scene. You can also say, I only allow humans in this one or um, only robots, only whatever. We're going to be able to set up those different categories and you would have to pick one from that if they don't have one yet. Okay, so that kind of makes it really cool with that stuff. And so how are you liking this so far? So now we're going to have the global login. And it allows you to do a local login for all you admins out there that want to work on your own servers and don't want to leave the original server. We're going to do the global logins, and then I'm going to clean up the camera system. So by the time I'm done, we're going to make that work like you expect it to in any game you do. That with the multiplayer, the second you start, the first day you download the code, you turn on a couple different switches and say, yeah, I want to use the global logon. Yeah, I want to use this. Yeah, I want to use this. Next thing you know, you're up and running. Everything works for you. So that's kind of where we are. Um, then you just have to customize your scenes and choose what you want in them. So that's the concept. And that's where we're heading. That's what we're building. Um, so if you want to help us build it, we always are looking for developers that want to play around and learn to be part of Walk the Web. As we get this launched, as we start making some money at it, and I need people to do certain things or whatever, I'm going to hit you guys up first, the ones that have been working with me. You're going to be able to make some money at it and... You know, as long as legally I can pay you from USA or one of our subsidies that I create. So just keeping that in mind, uh, we just got to have a way to pay you if it's legal. So just keeping that out there. Okay, so then anything you build and stuff, you can get in the scenes. You can make your own money by doing the plugins and stuff like I talked about before. Okay, now here we are. Let me show you and let's do a code walkthrough. I will give you the... Well, we will we'll walk through this a little bit, and I want to just show you around and give you a good feeling of where different things are so that you have a good uh, idea. I'm going to do something that I rarely do, which is close all my windows. I'll have to reopen them later when I want to do it. But I wanted to give a fresh, clean slate. Here comes the code walkthrough. When you download the code, it has four directories. Kept it nice and clean. I purpose, it was very purposeful in how I set this up. We have a number of files in the root, very minimal. Index is your main browsing page, so when come, somebody comes and visits your site. Admin PHP is when you're logged in and you are in admin mode. Doesn't mean it gives them any access to anything, it just loads it where you have that admin menu on the left and stuff, but then it depends on your access to what you actually can see when you get that far. So we'll keep that locked down. Uh, there's some license files. There's a web config in case you're on IIS, and there's an HT access file in case you're running in Linux. Either one of those. Um, they're very typical files, by the way. Basically, if it doesn't find the actual file there, it sends it to index.php. If the folder isn't there and the file isn't there, it sends it to index.php to interpret what to show. That is the exact same functionality that WordPress does. I didn't do anything crazy that WordPress doesn't do. It's PHP on the back end, it's JavaScript on the front end, and it's MySQL behind that. That's what we designed it to be. Anywhere that you run WordPress, you should be able to run this as another site on the same server. No additional requirements. That was... That was the goal from the very beginning. Is the only th Well, we do have one requirement for the users, and that is you have to have an HTML5 browser, which makes sense because WebGL, HTML5, the Canvas object and all that stuff is HTML5. So it doesn't work without it, but that's a pretty m broad range of, of browsers that allow you to do that. When, you, when I'm working in here, you've seen I've used Google Chrome. Uh, so that's what I design with. Okay, web.config, we're doing the same thing. We're looking for wildcards of his file, his directory, and we send it to rewrite to index.php. So that's the only thing we're doing really as a setup on here. 
Then let's go through a couple of directories. First of all, we have a core. When you get this, you will have the sample page. This one gives you a basic layout and a basic idea of what is expected in this file. You can set your own DB user, DB password, DB name, and you can even set a different table prefix for all of your tables. Um, yeah, someone should give you a chance to make a presentation for a larger crowd. Thanks, Bogus. <laughs> well, hopefully a lot of people will check out the video afterwards. I'll clip this section as a code walkthrough just so that people can look at it separately um, and get it on the YouTube site and on you know the videos from Twitch when we're done. So it will be available. Uh, but the table prefix allows you to set up multiple instances in the same database and each table would have that prefix. By default, we set it to WTW underscore, but you can put anything you want there. And all your stuff would work from there. Content path, you can move your content path, but mind you, if I add any new components to the content, it's gonna write it in that directory and you have to manually move them. We have instructions about that later. If you do not create this file before you load the site or run it for the first time, it will automatically ask you a couple questions for your database connection and your first user account. And it will basically throw it in there and create this file for you. <laughs> Thanks, Waffles. <laughs> yeah, so basically we can get it. It'll create the file for you. You don't have to do anything manually like this when you set up the site. It'll automatically prompt you and do that. So, of course, I have my active one and I keep a backup of it because every once in a while I delete the files in there and rerun the code to make sure that the install works. So, just want to let you know that's in there. Connect. These are the files that get read by another server from time to time with permission. And this is where the cross scripting kind of stuff happens. So, if I'm on another server and I need to load a building to a scene that's hosted on a separate server, then by URL, we're going to set up where all you have to do is know the URL and it automatically will come over here and these are the files that feed that information that shows up on the other page. Some of these are only accessed locally and they have the permissions set that way in PHP so that they can't be read by another server. But I was very cautious to always put it in the connect folder if it's something that reads a record set, which in this case is JSON files. So for example, buildings, if I'm loading a building, I track the page view for Google Analytics users. You just type in one ID and it'll automatically tell you what you have, uh, what's being used of that site. We have by user ID, which comes from a session variable, by the way, so you gotta be logged in, uh, which if there's different permissions allowed for different things, it does a query to the database. It sets up the record set in a format that is an array and then exports it as JSON encoded. That's how we distribute and give the information that is read in by a site, which means that information is not case specific to the game engine we're using. That's plans for the future, by the way. Little sneak peek. Right now we run on Babylon Game Engine. Okay, so you're going to see a lot of Babylon stuff, but I kind of created it with a degree of separation where at some point we can have servers running different stuff. So let's say I create one that's Babylon, then I create one that's 3JS, then I create one that's, you know, other things. We're not going to go into what it is, but we can create other things. As long as we're passing just the definition files of what to create, it relies on that own server to create it and play the game. So as long as we keep the information informational of what to do, not how to do it, we can allow the server to actually create it the way it needs to, and we can have many different versions of this in the future. Okay, with that said, um, as you can see, we do things like it has a building ID, a name, a snapshot. You know, we do some cool stuff, analytics ID if it has one, and we get out the basics. Then there's things like the building molds. You're gonna see two words that I created, or I didn't create the words, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not Webster, but that I use in here that I define my, for myself. And one of those particular words is mold. If you picture a mold, like you create a mold when you're working with Blender or something, what you're creating is the mesh. 
Now, the reason I didn't use the word mesh is because in Babylon, when you load something to the screen, it is your mesh that's in the, in the scene. I created the word mold so that we wouldn't get in a conflict of understanding what category or where you're at in the coding and stuff. What a mold is to me is it is the definition that will create a mesh when you need it in the scene. Because Babylon creates it right when you create it on the scene, mine gets created when you walk into a box on the scene that may or may not need to be loaded yet. Then when you walk inside of another box, which I showed you those action zones, what they do is it triggers to tell it to show it on a scene. I already have the definition in a mold. Now I tell it to use that mold definition to create the actual mesh. So I wrapped, it's, it's like the mold is the wrapper for the mesh with a lot of extra information like when to load it. I do the same thing with materials. When you create a mesh, you put materials on it to show a graphic or something on the surface or its properties of light and shadows and all kinds of stuff. I use the word covering for materials. It wraps the idea of what the covering will be when it gets created above and beyond. So you're going to see coverings and you're going to see molds throughout my cold uh, code. Sorry. <laughs> and basically that's what it is. Now, there are different layers of things that get built and added into a scene to make it work. Um, we're still in the connect directory. I just don't, I, I want you to get an idea of a couple of these because I'm going to mention them a handful of times and you're going to see some repetition here in the very, very near future in the next couple minutes. But what I want to tell you is this, when you load a scene, the very first thing that loads is a one by one by one cube that's invisible on the scene. That is global zero, zero, zero coordinate. Then the whole scene gets loaded based on that. Now for every building that you put in a scene, there is a one by one by one cube that is the parent to that whole building. That's why it was so easy for me to move the building, rotate it and scale it, because all I had to do was scale that one little cube and the whole building scaled in proportion to it. So that one cube, all I had to do was say, if this is the center of my community, my scene, this is where I want to put that building, and this is how I want to rotate it, size it, and everything else. Well, I call those connecting grids. It's like dropping a pin on a map. Put it here, scale it this size, and rotate it this way. That's all the connecting grids do. Um, well, I also give it where you can name something so that if you highlight over it, it tells you what that item is. So a little bit of alt tag stuff with it. Okay, but if I looked in my database right now, um, let me open the scene here. Let's close some windows here. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, most of the stuff doesn't matter. I'm going to drag it over here in a second. Okay, I run an error log and I run, you know, a number of things here. You're good with that stuff. Okay. Uh, peak, 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 peak. Okay, so what I have in here is, uh, those are my updates I'm doing. Um, if I come in here and I look in the connecting grid table, I'll just say alter table for a second so you can see. What I have, and yeah, it's even e easier to see if you just look at some data. Okay, first thing we have is there's an ID, which is a alphanumeric 16. They're randomly created, they're checked for duplicates, and it's put into there. I have this field past connecting grid ID because if you downloaded something from somewhere else, it knows what model you picked from and then it knows some of the data about the old model so that I can tell if you download something and somebody else built it and then you made your modifications, I can actually tell you how much of that object is the original and how much were your <coughs> object additions to it. It's cool stuff. Okay, but then we have a parent web ID, which in this case we were talking about being the community that you're in. And then we have the child web ID, which would be that little cube of the building or thing that we put in a scene. So if I come in here and said community, notice parent web type is community, and here's my parent ID. Then I have a child of a building, and here's the building's ID. Then I go on to the next part, which is 
What's the position, the scaling, and the rotation, just like I mentioned. And then the final part is what action zone, the loading zone, is going to bring in the rest of my data. It's the trigger point. So now that we have the connecting grids and it's the pinpoint, I identify the very first extreme zone that is around your building. And every single thing that we create has one of these extreme zones. It's the chain reaction. If you're inside that one, it goes out and sees what else I need to get, goes off on the internet, grabs it, brings it back, and then it loads it as you walk closer. So this is the trigger that says, here's what I might want to load if I walk closer to it. There it's where it goes and gets it. Okay, so we have this load action zone. Now, since I've talked about connecting grids, and as you can see, that's basically about all they are. There's a couple other fields, but that's some advanced stuff we'll talk about another time. So then from there, the second degree of what it does, like I said, is the trigger point, is the load action zones. So what is an action zone? When we're working in a scene, I'll just bring open, uh, let me see here. Um, I'm going to, I'll do this small. Let's go to the mountain lodge that we loaded in the other scene. So action zones, they're not just load zones. Load zones are a type of action zone. But what they are is they are trigger points. Um, when you browse an internet website, what do you do? You, you highlight over and you say, oh, that's a link, and you click it. It goes out on the internet, it gets something, and then brings it back, and then you see the new web page. Well, when you're browsing in 3D, the way I designed it, is you come in here and basically, let me face in the right direction so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so what I did was, instead of clicking links, I created zones that you walk into. It detects when your avatar walks into that zone. So to simplify that, let me turn on the zones and notice there are boxes. You can kind of see it here. There's a box there. Oh, by the way, anytime you're working in the admin section here, let me get that out of the way. Anytime you're working in the admin section, if you click this little avatar camera on or off, you can actually release yourself from your avatar and you can move around the scene to get a bird's eye view or any angle that you want to see. So if I back up far enough, notice Here's a box out here, then there's a second box here, and a third box here. These are, by default, the three action or load zones that every object has. This is the extreme zone, which would be in our connecting grid. It would reference that one. Because the second it loads the connecting grid, it goes out, figures out the definition for this, and then it builds that box around it. So if you're in that box, it loads the items that are in it because it detects you're in it. Then once you do, it may say, okay, load over these two other boxes. So now you walk in, if you're inside one of those, then it loads up whatever's inside of that. So it's a layering system of load zones. Okay. Now, if I go back to my avatar, I'm going to go reconnect to it. Another thing you see is like around this door. There's a box around the door. So that one is an action zone. When I walk inside it, it's going to trigger an action. The difference is when I walk inside this box, it triggers a load zone, which in this case happens to be all the stairs and some of the details and some glass on the front of the building and even a ceiling fan inside there that you can see. You get to, every time you add something to a scene, you can tell it which load zone to be part of and which one loads it. So you get the choice as a developer to pick which items you want to load and when. Okay, so then I walk over here and I go, okay, a sad walk does not suit me right now. I'm in a good mood. No, <laughs> I gotta fix that. It's gonna annoy me to death if I don't. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to my walk and okay, we're gonna be crazy. We're gonna go happy walk, which in a lot of ways is a delirious walk, but hey, I'm good with that for now. So as you can see, my happy walk now. Okay, when I walk inside of this box, it triggers a JavaScript that says open a door. When I built this door, I built it in place on my building and then I actually took the action zone and I told it when this door gets triggered, here's my hinge and I set the hinge where I wanted it. And then I actually told it which pieces are part of the door to swing when it rotates, which means not just doors, but anything in any scene. When you walk into a box, 
you can tell something to rotate around a given point. It can be vertical, it can be horizontal, it can be any degree in between. You can rotate the hinge any way you need it to be. If I come in here, say edit building, I can edit action zones. First thing is, these are the type of zones that you can create. So you can have load, load zones. You can create one that says, hey, if I walk in this box, I wanna load something in front of me. That's great to do. Uh, if you have a room that's hidden in the back of a house, you may say, I don't want to load the objects in this room unless I'm walking down the hallway or near this room. Then you can tell it to load when you're ready to load them. Keeps you from loading too much too soon, keeping the whole scene working fast. You get the concept. So we have a sliding door. So when you walk in it, something can slide. You can have a swinging door. Something will swing, like in this case. When I walk inside this zone, by the way, my mouse has to be over the scene. When I walk in, something is a swinging door. I can have um, an advanced click on a sliding door where you click it and the door will open just by clicking on something. Working on those. Those are getting there, but they, they actually work. Um, rotate. You can have something that just rotates the whole time, like that ceiling fan. If I just put something up there and it's not rotating on its own, I can tell it, rotate this object around this axis, and it will. So it's real easy to add animation to your scenes. I've already done all the heavy lifting coding to make it work in the game engine. All you have to do is say, I'm gonna add something that rotates, put the axle someplace just by moving it around, and then tell it to rotate and how fast, and tell it what rotates with that axis. Real straightforward stuff. Um, loading animations. I set up where if you walk inside of a box, let's say you're near a golf course, you can have the animations loaded for your avatar that tell it these are golf commands. This is how you swing. This is how you putt. This is how you line up and look at the ball. Whatever animations you want to load. Okay, so I'm going to open up this one for this front door. Lodge front door is what I named it. You can name them anything you want. And the only stipulation on that is if you don't use the word custom on a load zone, it will add that word for you. So just let you know in advance. I set that up to do that for a particular reason because those three zones are kind of overseen in some of my code to make it do different things. Like you can have them trigger different uh, Google Analytics so that you know if somebody walked up near your building and if it loaded at a distance, if it loaded close up or if they actually went inside. So those kind of things are set up for those zones. Okay, so we have things like swing distance. I can tell it when it opens up how far to swing. I can tell it the rotation speed. I can tell it the axis position, which I'm gonna move the position up for a minute, just so you can see, where is it? Oh, it's not moving. Why is, oh, my scene froze. Don't know why. I'm working on that beginning part and it's part of the login that it's messing with. So some of this stuff will work its way out just as I finish coding on here. You're looking at my coding site, by the way. This is not the final product. This is my dev environment, so just want to let you know that not everything is... <laughs> everything, some, some things are in limbo for things I'm currently working on. So, there we go. There's my avatar. There's the scene. Okay, so I'm going to turn back on this so you can see the load zones. Or even when you edit one, it'll show you the one you're working on. I'm going to tell it, lodge front door. And it shows you that. Uh, the other part is if I go upward with this, why isn't that moving? That's freezing it. Okay, I broke something. Oh, there it goes. There it is. That's the hinge right there. So if I go up far enough, I don't know why it's got a lag on that. Okay. See that little cube? That actually shows you that when you walk into it, that cube rotates. What I do is I parent the door items onto that. So we can come in here. You can rotate the axis any direction you want that door to move. For example, if I come in here, I don't know why that script isn't more responsive at the moment. But like if I rotate this, I'm just gonna show you how it can do something kind of crazy. Now when I walk in or out of this box, oh, it's not gonna do it. Oh yeah, see, the door went on an angle. It is not rotating square. It's actually rotating on an angle. You can see it came up on this angle. So you can actually design things to go whatever direction you want. If you want to create a DeLorean and the doors open this way, this stuff will do it. 
And finally, Show Advanced allow you to come in here and you can tell it the position of this box and scale and rotation of this box that when you walk in it, it triggers the door. So I can come in here and say, hey, I want the door to trigger when I'm far away from it. All I have to do is change this number down here and now, oh, that was the height, that doesn't help. Um, but I can turn around and tell it, make it whatever and it'll do it. I'm gonna adjust those things later, but okay. So we'll get that stuff in place. Yeah, um, then the last part, you tell it which action zone this action zone loads in. So I can say, when they're in the high action zone, now I want my door stuff to all load. So you can tell it exactly when to load it. Notice I have different, the extreme, the high, and the normal zone, which is when you're near. So that's all about doing these things. I really don't want to change this door right now, so I'm going to say cancel. But when you change something here, I'm designing the building, every scene that has it when it loads will automatically get the new version every single time. So you actually are dynamically creating and changing what is actively in a game on the internet. Pretty cool stuff, huh? Okay, so that walks you through. And action zones, like I said, there's a table for that. And the table specifically has what the action zone ID is, what community or building or thing it's in, and then there's some the load zone that brings it in. There's a friendly name for it that you can type. And then if it's a load zone or what type of zone it is, could be a swinging door zone or a sliding door zone or whatever. You can have different shapes. They don't all have to be boxes. So if you want a sphere around something or if you want a cylinder around something, all that stuff's available. And then we have some different properties of those sizes that I showed you from the forms. Okay. And they can cr trigger a JavaScript. So if you walk into a zone, you can have it set off your own JavaScript in a plugin. Create your own stuff and tell it what to do when it walks into it. Okay, so those are a couple of the big core parts of what makes this all work. Um, I've talked about the molds, which are the meshes. I've talked about the coverings, which are the materials. I've talked about the connecting grid, and I've talked about the, the action zones. Um, we have the communities, which are our scenes. The buildings, which are sections within the scene, can be a physical building or can be just an area. And then we have the things that you can put in buildings or into communities. We've got all these dynamics created out there and stuff. So that's the core of the program. That's the core. There's other things, of course, we have users and you know web aliases, so you can set a path and it'll be to a particular site. That's some cool stuff. I'll show you that later. Okay, so that gets us through the connect directory and a lot of the spatial concepts. Now to walk through this, um, there's a content folder and I wanna show you that there's really some just, well, I don't have it in my contact folder here and I'm just, there's a reason why. I purposely, I purposely only keep the plugins in the content folder on my site, but the content is your uploads. It is your system, it's all your images, it's your system files for the, the unit for my code, for the basically the way this 3D CMS works. And then it's basically that. But what we have is this. Um, I purposely put mine in a different directory. And the reason for doing this is I wanted uploads and system not to be in there so that if I search across the code, I don't have to search through all the images and stuff every single time or any uploaded file. So I these two folders would normally be in your content. Um, uploads are not there by default. It gets created when the first person uploads. And then in uploads folder, you will see buildings, communities, things, and users. Anything a user puts on there, it is under that user's um, account. That way you can backtrace as an admin and know who put something on the server by who uploaded it. It can be used for anything, but that's how we track who, who put it there. Also, the buildings and communities and things are from the shared items. So if you download something from my site saying, I need this community or this land or this building, excuse me, it will automatically create those folders and the images that belong to that item you downloaded will be in these folders. So if I came in here and said buildings, notice those are the building IDs. When I am in admin mode and I load a building, this is the ID really easy to find any time for admins. 
When you're browsing a site, you don't see those. They don't need to see them. But when you're admin and looking at a site, by the way, this is an active site. If somebody else is walking around in this scene, I would see them in this scene. That's the way this is designed. So you can turn that off in your settings, but at the same time, um, it is the live scene. So you can be in admin mode and the people browsing the site aren't, and you're still good, okay? Uh, but you get this ID, so NM050. If I look in the folder, NM050, this is the folder, and it will show me any textures or anything that downloaded with this scene. Uh, there's an MP4 video that was part of it for whatever reason. Um, I think I had some things in there at the uh, time that I tested and uploaded them with it so you'd have them. Uh, but then there's also some other things like the snapshots of what the building looks like when it's completed, um, when it's in place so people can see that and download it. Okay, so that's what's being downloaded when you click on and get that particular item. Okay, that's uh, that part of it. Let's move on to the next folder. The system folder, so that's uploads. You'll get a breakdown of each thing. They all work that same way, so that's pretty straightforward. The system, in the system folder, I've separated it by the animations for the avatars, the avatars that come as an avatar pack when you first get the system, so that you have some. If you were disconnected from the internet and you download the open source code, your site will still work. You don't have to worry about that. You basically have this site that has a full package that will make it run on its own. Then you can turn on features and do different things above and beyond that um, when you connect to the internet with it and stuff. But it's not a requirement. You can actually have your own development environment, have Avatar in there, you can work with it and everything else and not have it connected to the internet, never pay a fee and be able to use that environment to create things, make sure they work and put them out there for other people. So. I'm on the developer side if you haven't been able to tell so far. <laughs> developers can make money. Developers can do this. Graphics artists can do this and make money. People that are architects and want to build things in here can make money. Now you see where I'm going? Okay, so we have the avatars animations. Babylon files. I give you some files from start that I created that give you an idea of how things work and that you have some basic ideas. Um, some of these were like the skull from Babylon. It's a default that comes with Babylon. So you have those available and can drop them in a scene and use it, play around with it, whatever. There's a handful of ones I created or, you know, that are added in there. We also have icons. These are basically for the animations that are in the bottom of your screen here. So as you click this, these animations are there. And then finally, system uh, images. These are different images that, you know, they're part of your menu system, they're part of the logos, they're some pointers, some are help menus, whatever. These are the basics that come into the system. And finally, the last of it is the stock photos. When I went into, when I go to create something, let's say I haven't done anything else in here, and I'd say I wanna add a sphere. Let's, let's do something real simple right now. Close that off. And I'm gonna say edit building, building block, I'm going to put a sphere in this scene. First thing it does is it creates a sphere the second I tell it to create it. I can move it around and I can also scale it. I can rotate it in all three directions. And on top of that, I can color it so I can tell it what colors to do. Emissive is the core color of it and it's kind of the shadowing color from underneath. The diffuse color is the lighting color. So if I made this one white, notice when I set this diffuse color here, eh, it's hard to tell over a pure white, but notice how it picks up the sunspot. Now the actual sunspot is this one. So notice how it became yellow as I went there. We're gonna make this one blue, just so you can see. Notice the blue on this side, the red on this side, because it's red here, and then the blue is the shadowed side, and then the yellow is the sunspot. Okay, so you get in a little idea of how you can color things um, and work with them. You can make them whatever color you want. You can size them, scale them, drop them wherever you need them to be. You can, uh, there's advanced options. You can also change instead of color. You can go, I want to put a texture on this. And by default, if you change texture, now you can pick whatever texture you want it to be. Um, let's say I pick, I'm not going to pick one that's too dark because I want to show you an extra feature we have. I'm going to tell it sand color. Well, if you look closer to it, it picked up the grain of the sand in the texture, but notice we can still color it. 
If you want just the texture, the graphic image, without any shading or coloring, then go to the far left top on each one of these, which makes it pure white, and it'll be your original graphic. Otherwise, you can use a graphic, but make it look original in every scene just by changing the color of the item that you're working with. Now you have a unique graphic with its color added to it. So just giving you a hint that you can shade and texture an object. Now, if I was doing something like ceiling tiles and I had two objects that butted up against each other, there's some other helpful features I have in here. One of them is you can scale the height and the width of what you're working with, the, color, the image. Um, to show you that, I think the best way to do this is if I change the image to something that has lines in it. So this particular one, see how it has the lines in it? Now if I scale, first of all, 0, 0, 0 just means auto scale, which gives you, just so you know, 1 and 1 ratio. Now if I go smaller or higher from there, basically I am telling it to adjust. Notice the lines are getting closer on this object. You can type things. You can type like, let's say I go to point, um, point 20, whatever. When I move my cursor off of it is when it takes effect. Now there's almost no lines this direction. Let's say I made it two. What I'm doing is I'm doubling the scale. Now they're twice as often. So you can easily decide and move <laughs> their buttons. Don't worry about the um, when you hold the button down and it moves. Um, what's happening is I have not harnessed or scaled the multiplayer information coming through while you're working this, and so it's actually using a lot of the CPU. I'll scale that down and make sure it's not uh, throttle it so that it doesn't do that when you're in the scene. So that's why it's kind of got a delay. Normally these happen as soon as you touch the button, they're moving. So I'll fix that, uh, just the thing I noticed. Okay, so the other part is the offset. So if you butted two different things with a pattern on it up against each other, what you can do is you can change the offset. And what this does is it shifts the pattern on the surface of the item so that you can line up different patterns. Like if I did a ceiling tile and I wanted to make sure, or a tile on the ground and they have like grout in between, I can line up the grout and make sure that they're perfectly aligned. Between the scale and the alignment, you can set the textures. Oh, and another thing that's really cool, you can do the opacity. So if I want 50% opacity, I go to 50, and now you can see through that box. It's that easy, or that sphere. It's that easy to set the object's opacity. And then subdivision. This is cool because everybody knows when you're running an object, watch this. If I change the subdivision less, notice how we are getting the rigid object of basically that is a sphere at its lowest setting that Babylon allows. So it is pretty rugged. It's pretty straight edges and everything else. Well, guess what? I can come in here and I can make it be as clean of a sphere as I want it to be. If I want this thing to be 32, look at that. We got a perfect sphere. So you can make it be whatever subdivisions you need. Um, just remember, more subdivisions, more it takes when it loads. Just keeping that in mind. So do the lowest that is the acceptable amount of smoothness that you want this sphere to be in. If it needs to be good, set it good. It's going to work. But it, it may take a little longer to load or something. So just giving you that heads up. Um, if I, you know, like we're normally, if, if I'm doing something and I don't really need to tell, hey, 16 looks pretty darn good. And if I'm walking around a scene, most people don't notice that detail. But if I have something that needs to be, it can be. The other little things in here that I was showing you is select the reflection on the water. If you turn that on and you're anywhere near water, you will see it, it reflect in the water. Um, shaders on the surface, you can turn those on and you can also force the original graphic. This is where I was saying you can use 4K and 8K graphics. They don't have to be on everything. If you have one object that, that you just need the detail for an 8K graphic, click that checkbox and it'll always load that highest quality piece. The other one is this uh, sh shape visible distance. You have extreme load zone, high zone, or normal zone. If you added any custom ones, they'll show up in here too, and you can tell it what to do of when you want this object to load when you walk in the scene. You say save, it's here. Um, oh, another thing that you do have is you can merge. So like if this was colliding with another one, you can easily come in here and just subtract it from another shape or intersect it so they can create one mold instead of two. 
you could combine with another shape. You could do an intersection. So if you created two cylinders and you intersected them just right, guess what? You have a saddle shape. Not very easy to create, but here it is. Um, you can also select sounds. You can add a sound that is quieter as you go farther from it and louder as you go towards it to any object in our scenes. So you can add a sound. Um, it's louder as you get close. Like let's say I want the ceiling fan to make a sound like a ceiling fan's running. When you walk in that room, you'll hear the ceiling fan. If you get closer, it's louder. It's also 3D sound. So as you turn your head and your headset, it'll be louder on one side or the other as you turn. You can also build one thing, then come in here, click on it, go create a duplicate, and it'll make a second one for you in your scene. So you can build it once and then just duplicate it and put it wherever you want it to be. The objects that you add to your scene always start right in front of wherever your avatar is or your camera is at the time. So if you're disconnected from your avatar, it's gonna build it wherever your camera is. Just remember your avatar has to be in that load zone for it to be shown. That's just part of the little tricks about it. it doesn't hurt you from making a really big load zone and then closing it afterwards. You can make it smaller size later. Um, so we do have some really cool functions and features. As you can tell, I built things in here, so I kept on trying to make it work for me, add more features and stuff that I could use. Okay, back to the code. So from there, those are the couple different directories, and here's our default graphics, so you have something you can work with right when you start the scene. Now, going through the rest of that, that's the content folder. That's your uploads folder, so that's the file, the folder that needs permissions for when somebody's using the site like an admin and they're creating a building or something for you, they need access, uh, that user of IIS or, or from uh, Apache or whatever user you're using, it has to have access to be able to write in that folder. Now, the other folders, when you upload or download like the updates, I have some automatically updating processes. If you use those, then when it downloads the file, that user needs to be able to write to the whole structure to be able to update the files. But I only update what's in connect, core, and I may add things to the content system folder or update things there too. But other than that, your uploads are yours. I don't ever touch them. And that includes the plugin folder. Plugins independently update when they need to, um, but that's the way it works. Okay, so then let's move on to the core folder. The core is just that. It is what makes this whole thing work. And I tried to logically divide it into functionality. Okay, so for starters, your forms are all of the screens that you enter from the user interface, pretty much mostly in admin. I say mostly because they're not all. But when I come in here, and I right click on something and it shows me this over here. This is the form for edit. In this case, it says box, but it's an edit a mold. So it's editing one of our meshes. Okay. That in turn is forms mold. You open this up. This is what you're seeing. And there are sections of this form that don't apply to some of the molds. So some sections like text is hidden unless you're doing a text object. Some of the sections like image, if you're not doing an image with a hover image, you're not going to see that section. Um, some are video settings. If you upload a video file to play on a wall, that kind of stuff happens here. Uh, so we have different sections within those pages. Okay. But the, each one of these individually have their own form. If you're doing a connecting grid, here's the connecting grid layout of what we're seeing. Now, none of these do a post back. I'm just letting you know right from the start. It's the interface that the person is using to enter things. It is not what we're doing to write it, okay? Now, the reason we do that is because, as you saw, when we change something and save it, no matter what it is, let's say I you know, move a box or whatever I do, and I tell it to save it, it saves it, but this screen over here, the animation here, always stays active. To do that, we have to tell it to upload and update things outside of our main system. So basically, you're not watching the part that's actually updating. You are watching a facade. This is where you type in the information. I'm going to grab that information. Then I'm going to write it back to the thing. Now, how we do that is actually through 
scripts, JavaScript, it's all JavaScript driven. And then we call handlers, which are our JSON calls that tell it to place information there. And then they use our classes and our functions to execute the commands. So it's kind of a three level piece. You have your forms where you put in the information. When the JavaScript calls, it calls a handler. For example, if I update a mold, the handler reads in all the values that come from this on a posted form that happens in JavaScript. Then it decides what function you tried to run and which is part of our function call. And then it picks which function to actually execute. Some of these are really straightforward, like import molds as one function. And this one comes from our WTW molds common. So if I go up to functions, we have WTW molds common. That's where that's at. You will find import mold function. Here's the stuff that gets passed to it. And when you find it in here, you can see the function code of what it does. That's that straightforward. It's a three part model. Um, the only piece that needs to stand out a little farther than that is when you're in the functions directory, there's one in particular init session, and then there's one for admin, and one for the admin menus that get created, and then there's, are you in a meeting? <laughs> okay, and then there's just this, um, there's a database one that are specific, but there's also one for plugins that extend all these functions to a plugin and one the ones that you want to use. There's a handlers one that gets called in a handler file, and there's one in a connect file. What it does is I write the functions once and then I extend them to the different things. So like when I run a connect file and I tell it, for example, action zone, all I have to do is say, load this class connect, use this, and then I use it throughout this whole function. But guess what? Things like query are not in connect. Well, they're in there, but they're just pass throughs. And they are actually in the WTW database one because that's where it goes to the database. The good news is you can open up the database one and do different database models and different things for there. But you can use the ones that are just for connect in the connect file. You can use ones that are just for the handler in the handler file, any one of these. Here's your handler, it gets executed, and everything here can be done through the handler one. I tried to make it simple so that you're only including when you design something and you create it. If you create a handler, all you have to do is put in the handler class and you're good to go. Everything you do from there on out will include that handler class. So I've done the heavy lifting on making sure it all worked for you before you even start. Okay, I know your heads are probably spinning and uh, if you bear with me just a little bit longer, uh, the rest of this is actually going to go pretty smooth because we've already hit all the main components, the exception of the scripts. Okay, so then we do have some styles. There's one style that's a core style that loads with the people that are browsing the site. There's one that is an admin that loads only when the admins are running. So it's the core loads and the admin. Remember, everything for the browsing loads for the admin, but it has additional things loaded. So that kind of gives you that idea. There's a help one, and you know, which is just HTML page one, and there's an install specific one, okay, for the installers. Uh, we do have one shader in here. Of course, we may add more later, but that has to do with the water. And we have menus. There's an admin menu one, and there's a regular menu one. Eventually, we're going to get rid of the regular menu one and go to a heads-up display, but one thing at a time. And then we have pages, which are specific pages that load through iframes that show on your page. And like when we do a shopping cart and we're showing the original site, we may have a loading page that shows first. Or if you're playing a video and you want it to go to full screen, that kind of stuff is in here. And finally, the last of it is the scripts folder. I separated this on purpose by those logical units that we've been talking about. For example, for molds, we have add mold list. Here's the list that gets displayed on the page. We can have the you know, ones created beyond that. We have web molds that are like the Babylon file and light bulbs and candle flames and things that are more assemblies of web molds. And it tells you right here through a the shape that it uses, which is read in on the when it adds a mold the shape tells it which definition to use 
to create that object. Each one of these definitions are in basic molds. So add mold, we tell it to do the add mold function, then it comes in here and says, okay, we're using Babylon and here's how we create it. Here's how we create if it's a cylinder. Here's how we create if it's cone. Earlier we did a sphere, there it is, there's a sphere. That's how it parses it out and decides which thing to do. Now at different times when it creates the mold, it will also go back and look for the coverings. And as you can see, here's a list of the coverings that tell us what options we have for coverings. And then we also have the basic coverings, which, okay, a wireframe, a color, glass, mirror, there's textures, and then there's also directional textures. So you can line up bricks that go around a corner, stuff like that. So directional textures, taking account for that, and I took care of all the heavy lifting on that for you. So those are your coverings. We have the different types of action zones. Remember there were load zones, there were swinging doors and sliding doors and rotating objects. They're all in here, and the basic action zones are those. Um, we have automations we'll get into later, but that's how you can do a timing sequence, like rotate it 30 degrees, then do this, and you can actually step through different things that you want to happen in a chain reaction. That's kind of fun stuff, but it's not fully implemented here. It's in my test site more than here. We have the avatar creation designs. Those are in there. We have, and I'm not going too much into that because I'm moving some of that over to the, um, to the plug or the piece that I'm making now for the creator. And there's two main folders. Prime, here's all your core files that do creating the browsing. And here's all your core files when you're in admin mode that do the admin editor and init and inputs. So we do have an input file. We have an init file that does all your listeners and stuff like that. We have a constructor. So anything that starts with, okay, this is what we use here, but then when we initiate it, all of our class is a WTW. So all of our commands that are walk the web, WTW, are WTW dot and then whatever it is. Here are all your global variables for the, um, that you can use for, uh, for JavaScript. Um, there are a couple more that globally go above this because they're created through PHP. And just so you're aware of it, and I've shown you in some place, under functions, init session, if I scroll down here to this section right here, it is init JavaScript data, load init JavaScript data function. There are, if you're in dev mode, default domain, default site name, your Google Analytics ID that it fails over to if you're not setting anything individual for a building or thing or a community. Uh, there are some community and you always can get like the community ID of the community you're in or the building of the building you're in or the thing of the thing that you're in. Okay, so those things are always available. A um, couple other little pieces here, but that's the core. These are the only other ones that get added. You can tell protocol will either be HTTPS or HTTP. You can get the default or the domain URL that they visited. So if there's multiple sites being hosted by one server, WTW underscore domain URL is the URL with the domain name. If you want just the domain name, I mean, because that would include HTTPS or HTTP. So the protocol is included in it. And then domain name is if you just want 3 dot walktheweb.com, whatever domain you're in, it'll tell you that. So you can write those global variables into your code anywhere you want, and you'll have that information as you go. Okay, the rest of them were in the constructor. Now, another piece that helps us out with this is the object definitions. This is kind of a cheat sheet. Now, there's two places. You can either look at the connect, which if you, for example, brought up well, a building, it's gonna give you the layout basically right here, telling you, here's the building info directory. And so the response is building info and then all this building info information, the share folder tag, user authorizations, gravity, this and this, this. Or at any time you can go to object definitions and you can look at the definitions of the layout of any one of the objects. It's a quick reference, makes it easy to use. Also, if I create a new one, I can use this and it automatically gives me all the default values. So if I needed a new mold, all I have to do is include, there's connecting grid, there's action zones. And all I have to do is say new mold, just set a variable equals new mold and it automatically 
defines the mold layout. And notice how it's all the nested parts of it, like graphics. Then there's textures, height maps, and some offsets and scaling and load levels, all kinds of good fun stuff in here. And basically the colors are the three different RGB of each one of the diffuse, specular, and emissive. We have our sound files. We have um, objects if it has lights and shadows, we can define them there. Everything is attached to the mold that's actually part of that mold. So I even know what lights are gonna be shown on it. I know what shadows it's gonna cast to what shadow casters. Um, everything travels with it. So you can easily say, hey, I need to execute this JavaScript or what load zone did it come from? Everything is there in the object. You can set it, it'll be the defaults, and then you can set the values you need to afterwards. We have avatars, we have new path points. We, every one of these objects, so they're all here for your reference and you can use them anywhere you need to in the code. If you search across the code for one of them, you'll see where I used it and how I applied it. it becomes real easy to use. Okay, so that covers that section. Um, the core file is the most important part that you'll probably use when you're coding is you may want to know the load up sequence. Well, it opens the login and it starts doing the login so the screen shows up and then it has this load sequence. This is the way everything loads. So it initializes the environment. It loads initializing settings that get applied to the environment. It loads user settings. It loads the user canvas, which is the layer on top of the rendered canvas. Then it generates the load scene, which is the complete detailed version of what you're gonna see. And then load user settings after engine. So if there's something that you need to trigger after the scene loads and get it loaded in because it uses the scene, you can do them in that section. Now, each one of these are in order here. They're real easy to find, one after another, and you can glance in there and see exactly what it's doing. Okay, this is some core stuff. Another key part of this file after it does its loading sequence stuff is there's two other pieces that are important, and one of them is there's a start and stop render. So this is our render loop. If you've done anything with Babylon, this is the render loop. Okay, And check action zones is handled in the render loop. It fires it off. You can also manually trigger it just by saying WTW check action zones equals true. It'll cause it to fire off once, which means if you wrote something and you need to trigger it to say, hey, start it, you can do that very easily. This is where it decides, am I in the zone or is somebody else in the zone in your scene? Multiplayer stuff here. If somebody, if I'm standing in a scene, I need to know if I'm in there to open the door so I can walk through it. But there's also times where somebody else is in your scene and if they walk through the door, I don't wanna see them walk through a closed door. So their others are in the zone and I can define which things do what. So if they're in the load zone, that only applies to me. So I wanna know if me is in the zone and then it's gonna do it. If there's other things like, um, if I'm out, you know, if I leave the zone, then I wanna know unload the zone. Otherwise, if I'm in the zone, I want to load it. If um, load innovations or click activated doors, um, if I walk into a mirror area, if I do a ride along, which means hop on a something that's moving, I can adjust some things. There's different things I've defined and there's different ones that trigger different things. No matter what, I use status telling it, is it closed? Is it an open door? Is it in progress of opening? Is it in progress of closing? And I can actually capture those through the status currently on an object and I can actually make my JavaScript work based on those settings too. So all that stuff's in place here. And the final thing that's in this section, I'm not gonna worry about that one right now. The final thing is at the very bottom of this file is here is the movement of the avatar. This is what gets translated of what keys are pressed to how it shows certain animations and balances them between multiple animations and what distance you travel based on what you're doing. So move distances and move with collisions of your avatar and stuff. This is the breakdown of where that works. Um, another video, another day, I'll break down how a plugin works and we'll go into the details of that. But this pretty much, the core file is how the thing runs and fires off and goes. Okay, the counter component to that, if there is such a thing, is the common file. The common file is 
basically walk the web library of commands. This is stuff that gets called. These are your common things, like I have a log that you can drop things into the console, and you can even color them just by putting a comma after what you tell it to throw in the console. I have, hmm, in my code, if you start digging through code, you're gonna see dget, okay? I probably saved a million lines of code and yet you can still understand what every line means just because I say, or million characters maybe, I don't know, it's an exaggeration, but you get the point. Dget is document get element by ID. That's what it is. Notice document get element by ID and it just passes it into it. So if I say dget, it just means document get. I got it. I know what I'm going to do. Then all I have to do is tell it the name and I can still append anything else I would after the document get element by ID. But if you see dget in the code, which is going to be a lot of places in here, you just know okay, I'm getting that item, and then I'm adding, in this case, a style to it. Uh, I'll do a click, I'll do an on click, I'll do a whatever I need to do. Anything that document get element by ID does. So it's a shortcut, and I allow it in the code. I didn't put that inside of, you know, the walk the web wrapper of the class, only because I did do both. So if you do type it with WTW, then it does it, but I save more characters if I don't. So just a quick easy way. I use that throughout my code. Um, nice little function. I have things like the get JSON and the post JSON classes. I have get a web page to show in an iframe, uh, or get an i or get a page that shows in a tab. I have scripts for uh, to load J uh, JavaScript files on the fly. I have ones that unload them on a the fly. I have it so you can check to see. You can just tell it to go to this function and it'll look to see if it's already loaded. And if it is, it doesn't load it again. And it'll unload it if everybody that called it is already out of there too. So it tracks how many times it's been called. And each time somebody leaves an area that tells it to unload it, it doesn't unload it till the last person that leaves that area tells it to load it. Cool stuff, huh? There's a lot of stuff in here but we're loading scripts automatically while you walk, unloading them when you walk. There's a couple functions to highlight stuff. There's things, there's one section called uh, dispose um, clean. And that function, well, we even detect browser types and stuff like that, but this dispose clean is an important one because it's a way I get rid of an object and I check for child objects, I check if a sound was running, I check if animations were running and I turn them all off and destroy all the objects because I needed to make sure everything turns off that we had created when we close off an object so that we can clear as much memory as possible every time we do things. Okay, so that stuff is all in the common file. Uh, that takes you through most of these. As you can see, the init file, there's all of our le event listeners for touch screens, <coughs> uh, mouse movements, and keyboard actions. There's a lot of stuff we do with that. And the onload, we do a Google Analytics push if you use the Google Analytics ID. And then basically we send some commands. We check the size of the window and resize things. And we do the init events, which was our core file right at the top of the page. There's our init load sequence that you mentioned. we mentioned. I think I'm making sure I'm not gonna run that twice, but we'll do it. Okay, and then access denied if they do not have access to a site that we are locking down. Okay, so we have a bunch of things in here, handful of different pieces. Um, there's all kinds of things. PHP locks it down way before that, so you don't have to worry about that. That's just a visual thing telling them that they've been locked out. So that's <laughs> just to expose what we needed to to them. Input, this is all your touch commands and what they do and which functions they run when they get there. Um, we tell it which keys are pressed and tell it to you know, isolate from execute for your avatars. So everything's here, everything's here. We keep on adding things, we keep on working with it, but that's where we're going. And like I said, the admin editor, this is kind of like the catch all for admin code. Uh, when you're in the admin editor and you tell it to do something and change something, whatever, it's all in here. So I'll leave that for now. But yes, so if there's any questions, I probably made everybody's head spin today, but it was a good thing because with that code, you can look back at it, you can watch the video again, I'll put it on the YouTube page so that it's preserved after Twitch drops it, but um, we'll have it out there, you can use it anytime. I try to periodically jump in there and recheck it again, 
and make sure that it's an updated version like I just did now so that you get the latest and greatest at all the times. So periodically I'll walk you through that section and you can, you can definitely check that out. But that gets you through what we have. Um, just so you know, in the main scene, what I'm doing though is I'm making it so that we have a nice friendly login that works everywhere and then you're going to be able to custom design your own avatars. I'm going to give you the ability to download the skeleton of an avatar and the current ones that we're using so that you can use it as a model to modify it and create your own or you can even put complete new meshes on the same old skeleton. I just caution you if you use the same skeleton then all the animations that we're using in our system will work. Otherwise you'll have to create every single animation that you want to use in the scene too. And there are going to be games that automatically give you animations that they want you to use in their game. Those won't work unless you're doing the an avatar that doesn't have a custom skeleton. Okay? Not discouraging you from doing it, just letting you know that, let's say you want to play a round of golf, you might not be able to walk in there if you created a Godzilla. You will have to have the same type of skeleton. But if you did, Use the same skeleton in Godzilla, damn thing would work. Um, also, you will be able to switch your avatars and pick any of your global avatars at the time and he will transform into that one. That's my plans. Hmm. So we have some cool stuff ahead of you. You've heard what we have so far. You've also heard some of the dreams of what we're building. You've also heard a little bit of touch of the direction we're going. Um, a lot of things that you'll see in the near future. So I hope that you've had a good chance of catching some of the things that interest you. We are always welcoming developers who want to create something for this type of functionality. You can either help us with the core, work out the bugs, make it all run smooth, and work on that side of it, or you can create your own plugins with you and your friends. I will support you either way. Um, if you want to help us, jump in Discord. If I'm not here, you'll find me in Discord. I work almost every single day of the year. There's a couple exceptions, like I actually took Easter off yesterday. So just letting you know, but same thing. It's just a matter of I'll help you build what you need. So if you're building a plugin and you join into my Discord and you connect with me, if you need something, you're my higher priority over people that come later. Okay, so join in, ask your questions. There's a group of us that are over there supporting you. We'll partner with you on creating something or help you assist you we'll also let's say you're building a plugin you say oh this will only work if we did this on the core let me know what those things are we're going to work out a way to make it work we we want to make it do everything we can we don't want to block off what you want to try to do with it so our goal from the very beginning is to let you be creative let you create the things you want to create but then share them so they work in every site. So my job is to create the common environment that the users can come into. And then you create a site and I go, hey, there's a new site over here, it looks cool. And I send you all the users over there to go check it out. That's what I wanna be able to do. I want to be able to support you and say, oh my God, we got a really cool scene. This guy created a really cool game or this person, this girl created a really cool store or a really cool game. I want to be able to say, oh, I want to show it off and I'm going to tell everybody about it and I'm going to broadcast it to all of our users and next thing you know, all these people, because you use the common framework, are going to come rushing over and check out your scenes and it's going to be a cool thing. So that's the goal. That's the thing. I'm going to help developers make money. You can make your own plugins. They don't have to be partnered with us. That's all fine. If you want to, we're building some core ones right now. You'll see some of the, some of the marks and uh, you'll see some of the channels in in Discord that talk about some of the ones we've talked about making. If we haven't started building it and you are really interested in doing it, let me know because we'll give you the information we have, we'll help pass on stuff to you and you can build it. Uh, you can work with us or without us with it. So just giving you the heads up, the offer's on the table. We'll keep building things. We're gonna make it all work. We're gonna create different things and notice, hey, we even got our building over there that we added while we were talking about it. So. Okay, well, I hope you guys all had fun. I'm going to call it a day and get back to coding because I've got to finish writing the, the change avatar set and make sure everybody can create their own avatars and do their stuff. So I'll have that in place soon, and then you're going to be able to do the global avatar, or global login, 
set up your avatars, and drop them right into scenes. So I'll have that part smoothed out this week, and then we will really, I want to, I want to see once that's done, we're going to get back together, and everybody can join in the scene and have a good time. So thank you for watching today. I really appreciate it, and, you know, um, just having fun. We're just out there having fun. Um, let me take a quick glance here. And I want to thank anybody who's followed us, and especially in the last couple hours. It's been a pleasure, and I'm really grateful to have you. And like I said, catch us on Discord, because if I'm not here, you'll find me there. Have a great day, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, let me see. Do we have somebody? I'm going to take a quick glance here, and I want to see if any of my friends are broadcasting right now, because I'm gonna we're going to rate them. So let's see who's online. And who's online? Who's with me? Who's with me? Um, oh, there we go. There we go. Okay. I know where we're going. We're going to go say hi to Cloud Monk. So let's go say hi to Cloud Monk. Let me see. Um, I know. I just opened the page. I, didn't, I left it. Okay. Do, 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 do. And off we go. Let's see. Come on, come on. Load, 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 load. Ah, there we go. 